Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Uh, on or around December 28th, 1989, the grace of God separated me from alcohol. Um, I found my way back into Alcoholics Anonymous, not really understanding what it was or what I was really needing to do. And, uh, and the magic and the miracle uh, started to happen to me. And I haven't, had it, I haven't found it necessary to have a drink since that time. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, you know, I'm, uh, this morning I'm a stand in for Sandy and I'm following Charlie and Katie. Uh, that's, that is a, that really is a tall order. Uh, uh, man, you know, uh, Sandy had incredible impact on me early on. You know, I, I think, uh, most of us have probably heard the drop the rock talk, uh, and some of his step study work, uh, absolutely phenomenal, essential, I think for anybody. He's, uh, he's one of our great, um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous philosophers, you know, and uh, I've learned so much from him over the years. And uh, I get to hang out with Charlie and Katie quite often these days, and uh, that's just, that's like a show. That's like recovery in a show, you know. I, 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 I love that. I love that. You know, character defects. Um, you know, when I first showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, what I was mainly interested in is separating from alcohol. I, you know, I knew alcohol was killing me. I knew it was causing a lot of problems in my life. And I really thought that my, the main focus needs to be to just stop drinking alcohol. What I found out, what I found out uh, in AA, though, was what alcoholism is. And, you know, I almost drank in reaction to my alcoholism. I, I used to think I used to think I was an alcoholic because I drank so much. And today I believe I drank so much because I'm an alcoholic. And those are two really, really different things. And, uh, you know, I understand today uh, what I'm up against. Uh, alcoholism is an unbelievably unorthodox, aggressive illness. It presents in all kinds of bizarre ways, uh, especially in my particular case. Uh, but the first manifestation, I believe, of alcoholism that I can remember uh, happened to me when my mother asked me to get in the car. Uh, it's the first day of kindergarten. I'm driving you to kindergarten. And I remember getting out of the car and standing up on the hill and looking down at the classroom. She closes the door and drives away. I'm looking down at the classroom, and all these kids, they're already having fun. They're playing kickball and tag, and I'm standing up there on the hill absolutely filled with self-centered fear. I, I'm thinking, who came up with this kindergartner idea? This is, this is wrong on many, many levels, you know? I was, I was doing fine with one woman and one house, you know? And, 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 and this, is just, this is just wrong. Uh, but but I knew I had to go down there and do that do it. I had to go down there and be a kindergartner. And I you know I was worried about if the kids would like me, what what they'd think about me, would they make fun of me, would I have to get in a fight? I mean all this stuff is going through my head. It, it didn't seem to be bothering the other kids. They're already having fun. So what what I believe is I believe that alcoholism has a lot to do with separation from God and separation from our fellow man. It's just, you know, I was on an island. I was, I was like, I was like little Chris who was all on his own. And, and it just, it was a, it was a bizarre way to perceive uh, reality. Now, now I went down there and I was the kindergarten, I, I, I did the kindergarten thing, right? But what really would have helped me at that moment, walking down that hill would have been a pint of vodka. I got to tell you, it, that would have that would have been exactly what I needed, you know, to be able to fit in with everybody. But they weren't serving five year olds at, at, at that time. So so I had to do it all on my own. Uh, and I did for about seven or eight years. 
uh, I did the school thing. I never, I never felt right, but I wasn't going to let you know how wrong I felt because I really thought that there was, you know, I, I was different. There's something wrong with me. And one day, I think I was in around seventh grade or so, um, uh, me and a couple of my buddies decided that we were going to cut school and we were going to go back to my house and we were going to get drunk. It's like, this is a really cool kind of a thing. We could go brag the next day at school. So that's what we did. We went back to my house, and, uh, and I pulled a, a, a bottle of Four Roses whiskey down off the shelf, and I poured three big water glasses, and me and my two buddies started to drink. Now, my two buddies never became alcoholic, never became problem drinkers. They drank two-thirds of the glass, and they'd had enough. You ever drink with people that have enough on you? You know, is that, is that annoying? You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I start drinking, I get it done. I, you know, I, it, it's, it's a thing for me. I, I'm going to get this done. And every once in a while, I'd be drinking with somebody who'd have enough and they'd need to go home, and, you know, and because, because my wife is cooking dinner or something. And I'd be like, are you crazy? Let's go to the city, you know. Let's, let's, and, 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 you know, these guys would have enough and, and they'd go away. And that's what these two guys, they, these two guys had enough. And, uh, and, and they sat back and they watched the show is what they did because I did not have enough. Uh, I drank my glass, their glasses, the rest of the bottle, and I went into my first blackout. Any blackout drinkers in here? Man, oh, man. Is that disconcerting or what? You know, like, like coming out, not knowing what you did. This one time, this one time I quit my job in a blackout. I, I, I called my boss up. I threatened his life. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to come and I'm going to kill you. And because I was in a blackout, I didn't know the next day that I had done this. So I walk into work the next day. Da, 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 you know. He's like, he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what? You said you were going to kill me last night. I'm like, what'd you do? You know, I mean, I mean, we have to deflect everything. We can't possibly take responsibility for anything because it would be inconvenient, you know? I'd have to deal with it. So, so, uh, so I was, this stuff was always happening to me. A anyway, you know, what happened, what happened when, uh, when I started drinking and I went into the blackout as, as like the 11, 12 year old kid was, that scared kindergartner that I'd been living with this whole time, the, just being uncomfortable myself and my environment and having that that level of anxiety right across the board all the time, always worrying about what you're thinking about me. I started drinking that Four Roses whiskey, and that went away. It was gone. All of a sudden, the, the fear was gone, you know, that, 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 uh, that terrible feeling of not really being part of or, or feeling like I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people. All that disappeared, and I felt larger than life. It, it, just absolutely, absolutely amazing, amazing tool, uh, alcohol. And I start to, started to become preoccupied with it right away because I needed something to get me out of me. You, you know, like, like for the alcoholic, we so think that alcohol and drinking is our problem. Re really, sobriety is really what, what, what our problem is. I, you know, I'll give you, I'll tell you one story that, 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 shows, that shows this. Um, toward the end of my drinking, uh, I had a terrible job, and what I would do is I would leave that job and, and, and haul ass to the liquor store to get vodka or bourbon or whatever. And, I mean, I, I would head there like a maniac. I was driven to get to that liquor store. And I remember this one time, I, I would go in this liquor store, and I knew right where the vodka was, I knew right where the bourbon was, if it was winter on bourbon, uh, summer on vodka, for some crazy reason. And, but I knew right where it was, and I made sure the guy always stocked it, don't ever run out of this, you know, and, and, uh, and he knew, uh, so he never did. But I remember I grabbed my vodka and I went up and usually I can just throw my money down and get the hell out of there and get home and start drinking. And, this, and I get behind, there's a woman in line like talking to the guy who's going to check me out. She's going, she's going, yeah, what kind of wine goes with tilapia? <laughs> and, uh, and the guy's going, well, you know, there's a Chardonnay from the California vineyard that has a marvelous blush. And I'm standing there with my vodka. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> You're going to talk about what kind of wine, because there's a wine job. I need to buy this vodka. Get rid of this woman. Give her a bottle of Gallo and get it the hell out of my way. Are you, are you nuts? You know, I got a problem here. I, I got a problem. I'm sober. 
I gotta get out of here. You know? And that really was what my problem was. My my problem was I was sober and I can't stand being sober. I can't stand being in my own skin for five seconds. You know, I mean, it's it's unbel it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that I'm standing here today because, you know, my first six months or so uh, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous was really kind of in an unrecovered state, and I felt like I was standing behind the tilapia woman for like six months. You know, I, I and uh, and you know, thank God, thank God, uh, thank God, I made it. But you know. Self-absorption. You know, Charlie and Katie did a marvelous job about talking about how selfishness and self-centeredness really is the root of our troubles. And sometimes it takes a long time for that to really ring true. It, it did for me. I mean, you know, I, I did not think I was my own problem for quite a while. I, you know, uh, that would not have really worked well for me. Uh, you know, you you were the problem. You know, you know what I mean. You you were. You know, it's it's about you. And if and if and if this was different, or if that was different, or if I wasn't with these people, it wouldn't be the way it is. And, and I always had to deflect this stuff. But uh, you know, the longer the longer I'm sober, and the more work that I do, uh, the more spiritual work that I do with the steps, the more I realize that really selfishness and self-centeredness really is the root of my trouble. Uh, uh, Self-absorption, just always, it's, it's always about me. It, it, you know, I see things through my eyes and, you know, you all are, uh, are, are alkanauts orbiting planet Chris and, you know, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, how you're, when you're going to come in for a landing, is it going to work for me? You, you know, it's, it's just, it's just absolutely, it's just absolutely nuts. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the, the way, uh, the way we think, uh, just being so focused on, uh, on what's going on, uh, with, with us. And some of the lessons that I learned from my, my early sponsors, um, you know, I, I, rem I remember this, I remember this one time, uh, I got a sponsor. His name was fish food, Phil. Everybody had nicknames back then. Uh, Fish Food Phil uh, came up to me one time and he said, you're, you're celebrating 90 days. And I remember all, thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to have to get up in front of people and I'm going to have to say thank you. I don't know if I can do this. This is going to this is going to be really rough. And we're, and we're driving. We're driving to the meeting and he can see me in the back just panicking. I'm going into like a panic attack. And he turns around. And he goes, he goes, Chris, man, am I glad I'm not you. And he goes, uh, he goes, I am so glad I don't feel as uncomfortable as you feel right now. I'm like, thanks, Phil. And, and, he, and he goes, and he goes, but listen, but listen, I, I need to tell you something. I got, he, he goes, he goes, I am so glad I don't feel the way I do, uh, the way I did it 90 days. And he had 10 years at the time. He goes, I'm glad that I don't feel like uh, I felt it one year. He goes, he goes, I'm celebrating 10 years and you're celebrating 90 days. I am glad that I don't feel the way I felt it nine years. And what he was telling me, what he was telling me was to hang on to this thing and to stay here and to, and to keep working because uh, because recovery can be progressive, too. Uh, and over any any uh, uh, considerable period of time, if we continue to practice these principles uh, in all of our affairs and uh, remain consistent with meeting attendance and, and be accountable to a sponsor and all the other things, uh, uh, you know, the way we feel about the world. And uh, our level of comfort in the world uh, uh, increases. It gets better. And that's really the lesson that, uh, that he was trying to tell me. And one of the other lessons that he tried to get me to do was he tried to get me to be of service. Because an antidote to that selfishness and self-centeredness is sometimes to do things for fun and for free. Uh, to actually uh, be of help to somebody without expecting anything back in, in return. And, you know, I, I examined that uh, one time during an inventory, and I realized that I'd never done anything for anybody without expecting something back in return, even if it was praise or thanks or, or you know, uh, put, putting that IOU in my pocket or whatever. Uh, I, I would never I would never do something without expecting something back in return. And isn't that the epitome of, of self-centeredness to be 
to be that kind of a, a person. So what, uh, what my sponsor started to do is he started to ask me to do commitments. Uh, he wanted me to, one time I remember he asked me, uh, you're going to be a cook at the, at the uh, picnic for the rehab. So I remember I'm standing behind a, a grill cooking uh, shellfish with the wind blowing in my face for about three hours. I, I smelled like a burnt crustacean, you know. But and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Phil, you know, I need to can I stop? You know, they're playing frisbee and everything. He's like, No, you're you're cooking, and and it went so against my nature. It went so against my my selfish, self-centered nature. I wanted to be out there having the most fun. I didn't want to be of service. Yet he started to make me. He started to make me do this, and uh, and it really did. It really did start to help. You know, so often we're in so much trouble, we, we don't even know how much trouble we're in. You, you know, the, the alcoholic is someone who is absolutely minimizing their situation. They, they, they are so minimizing. I mean, we're in always ten times more trouble than we think we are. You know, uh, uh, I remember working with this one guy once, and he comes to me because his life is on fire. I mean, this guy's life is on fire. He's burnt down everything, his job. He's thrown out of college. Uh, the, his parents are kicking him out. The cops are looking for him. I mean, just blew up his life. And he's going through all this stuff, and he's giving, he's giving me the rundown on all the drama, you know. And, and when he's done, I go, I, I go well, look, look, I'm, I'm pretty reason, I'm reasonably comfortable that you're an alcoholic. And, you know, alcoholism is, uh, is a progressively fatal illness unless it's put into remission through spiritual practices. So let's get going with the spiritual practices. Let's, let's uh, you know, come over to my house tomorrow night and, uh, and we'll, we'll start on the steps. And he's like, tomorrow night? <laughs> like, well, man, tomorrow night, well, that, tomorrow night's not cool. Uh, all right, uh, Tuesday? Oh, well, you know, I'm not really going to have much time for this spiritual thing. Uh, I'm, you know, it's summer and I, I usually tour with the dead. And, and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, Dude, man, you're you're what? You're gonna die. You have a fatal illness. You you know you're you're gonna you're gonna die. Uh, you know in disgrace. You know you're gonna. You, no one's gonna be left around you when you die. You're gonna check out in the most uh, ignoble way possible. You know we we alcoholics just go out in the most pathetic way. And and you're you're worried about touring with the dead. You're gonna be the dead. You you know and. Some, sometimes, sometimes the insanity of alcoholism is an inability to adequately self-appraise your situation. And some of us just, you know, we, we, we just make it long enough. You know, we stay sober long enough to start to realize that we've got, we've got a, a, a spiritual malady that needs attention. And we start to do the things that don't, don't make a lot of sense. You know, the, the, the practices that they, they ask us to do sometimes don't seem to directly relate to what, what our problem is. I remember I went to my, my sponsor one time early on. I said, I said, Phil, Phil, man, you know, the, the, the guys are going to come break my legs and go out over here. I got problems with the car. I got, you know, a girlfriend broke up. It's really terrible. And he goes, uh, Chris, do you pray? I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, do you pray? I'm like, do you need me to start over again slow? <laughs> what, what does that have, what does that have to do with, with anything? And, and, and he goes, here's what I want you to do, you know. And he, and he gave me a prayer discipline. And, and I walked, I walked away thinking, you know, he doesn't get it. But 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 I decided to go ahead and do what he asked me to do because he'd had this this series of of uh, uninterrupted being right, you know, about things, you know, for, and it was it was a coincidence. I knew. Uh, but but but, I, you know, I was willing to see how long this streak, you know, uh, was going to was going to go for. And I, you know, I started doing. Now I, I realize it today. I realize it today that if he was going to help me with with the bone breakers, if he was going to talk me through the drama of uh, the relationship, or or take me to motor vehicle to get my license back, or any of that stuff, which I kind of expected, he'd be he'd be helping me with the symptom. He wouldn't he wouldn't be working on the causes and conditions of my failure at life. 
The causes and conditions of my failure at life was the, the, my perspective on my life and how I operated, my operational methodology based on selfishness and self-centeredness. And he was trying to correct the causes and conditions, the real problems in, in, my, in my life. You know, I got to a point, uh, I got to a point where uh, I realized that I needed to start to do the steps. And, uh, uh, you know, Charlie was talking about uh, uh, the tapers and, and how important they are. I've got to tell you, I got to tell you, a series of tapes saved my life. I was in a, I was in a, a discussion meeting group and I, I was in a beginners meeting group and I, I was in some groups that were really good. They were good fellowship, but there was not a, there was not a lot of direction as far as uh, is the, the taking of the steps. There's a lot of talk about the steps, but very little about how, this is how you actually do them. And I, I got a hold of a, a, a series of tapes, and uh, I started listening to them, and uh, I got really upset. I got really upset because the message basically was this. You know, Chris, you're, you're a fellowship maniac. You're, you're, a, you're a behemoth of the fellowship. You know, you're, you're going to 14 meetings a week and, and you're, you're a treasurer here and a coffee maker there and you're driving the boobies to the hatch. And, and, and in North Jersey, there's a commitment called the no-show GSR. And I, and I, was, I was a no-show GSR. I was, I was doing it all. Uh, I was doing it all. And, uh, and the, the series of tapes, basically, the message that it carried to me was, uh, you have no program. And I'm and, and really that that's what I got out of these tapes. You don't have any program because you're not doing this. And and I thought, what are you talking about? People are patting me on the head. Chris, you're doing great. I see you at every meeting. Pat, pat, pat. You know, Chris, how you doing? Oh, great. You know, the, the typical typical unrecovered answer. Really good. Great. You know, when what, what was really going through my mind sitting in that meeting was something like this. Oh, God, listen to this guy share. Oh, oh, make me sick. Oh, my God. Oh, I can't believe it. What a hypocrite. Oh, oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. He's, he's raising his hand. Oh, no. Oh, no. Please don't. Please don't call on him. Please don't call on him. Oh, they're calling on him. Oh, no. Now I'm going to have to hear him share about his family. Oh, tell somebody who cares. You know, but, I, but I'd be sitting there like this. Wait, what a good meeting. It was a gratitude meeting. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. When in my head I'm thinking, gratitude meeting, I'm going to slash all four of his tires, follow him out into the parking lot and see gratitude in action. That's what I want to see. Oh, I was out of my mind in my head. But, you know, fine. Really good. Huh. I read The Road Less Traveled, y you know. Oh my God! But I, but I, you know, I'm a swirling dervish of unrecovery. You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm just out of my mind. So, so anyway, what what happened was I became convinced through some more uh, bad luck uh, that uh, that I needed to I needed to do something to feel better because I just didn't want to feel bad anymore. I felt terrible. So, uh, so uh, you know, I started to do I started to do some step work, and I was following a, a, a series of tapes and a tape guide, and I started to go through the steps. Now, now, what what happened with me was uh, slowly. It, they talk about in the spiritual appendix. They they say some of us have a, a, a spiritual awakening of the educational variety. Slowly over the course of time, that's what mine was because I was slowly doing the steps over a course of time. You know, you can actually have a, a very profound spiritual uh, experience if you if you go a little bit quicker than I did. Um, but um, but what happened was, you know, I went through these steps and, and where where there was an instruction, we put this down on paper in black and white. I would do that. You know, and and I would I would stop and do the instruction before I moved forward. Uh, and and I so I started to go through the steps in a very very haphazard way and uh, no one was really guiding me you know I was doing it myself but enough of a uh, enough of the magic of uh, the spiritual process happened that uh, my, my spirit started to heal you know we, we've got there's so much damage that we come in here with you know and we've damaged so many people but there's so much damage that it can it can really take a lot of uh, a lot of attention to detail 
uh, to really start to, to come back. But what happened was, you know, I get I get to the steps and, you know, meanwhile, I start to sound good uh, in the meetings. Uh, I'm listen, I'm sounding a lot better than I am. Uh, and that's that's OK, I guess, uh, for some of us. But I was starting to get people to ask me to sponsor them. And uh, my my pat answer was yes. Um, what do you want me to do? I mean, it was just a crazy way to, to sponsor. Uh, and and these guys were, these guys, a lot of them were drinking on me. You know, any, anybody in here sponsor people that drink on you? It makes you look bad, doesn't it? You really lose status, uh, you know, when that, when that happens. So I came up with the idea, okay, let's, let's just bring them over to the house. Let's, let's do some step work. And we started to do that. Uh, I got a bunch of people, um, you know, through through the 12 steps and a bunch of people that didn't go through the 12 steps. And, and really, the, the, the wonderful news about all this is, is that the people who actually did the fourth and the fifth step, who actually did uh, the eighth and the ninth step, actually went back out and made amends and actually put together a, a prayer meditation discipline and actually started to take other people through the steps. Every one of them is still around. And you know this is back in the this is back in the early 90s when when this began. They're still all around, and the people that did not make it to the steps, they're all gone. I'm not saying they're drinking, but uh, but I I will say I don't know where they are. We're not we're not still in touch. So, it, you know, so that's a that's a lesson I need to continue to pay attention to. That there's a power there's a power in these steps. Listen, lack of lack of understanding is not our dilemma. Lack of knowledge is not our dilemma. Lack of power is our dilemma. So, you know, where are we going to where are we going to get that power? How is that power going to manifest? That power manifests through our participation in the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And if we continue to do the things that are laid out to us in uh, in in the literature, what will happen basically is uh, uh, We'll be in the sunlight of the spirit. And when we're in the sunlight of the spirit, uh, the obsession to drink alcohol is removed and we, we can become happily and usefully whole. Uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely amazing thing. Now, um, I learned a whole lot about my defects of character in the four step. Anger, fear, and my conduct. That's like everything. When, you know, when I first was exposed to that, that inventory, I'm thinking, man, he's leaving a lot out. You know, this doesn't really specifically cover me. Uh, you, you know, what, what, I, what I've learned is that is the whole Megillah, you know, my, my anger, my fear, my, my conduct. And, uh, you know, I started to look at that. And I think that uh, I think it's necessary for each of us to come to terms with those inventories, because if you're working on the wrong problem, you're not going to get the right solution. And. The problem that I was working on for the first six months was not drinking a day at a time. You ever meet people like that to do that year after year in AA? I'm just not drinking. <laughs> if you'd have told me when I first came in, I'd have to do all these steps and all these commitments, and I'd have been right at the door. And when I hear somebody share like that, I go, you're overestimating our concern about whether you're going to leave or not. You know? Uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure we need you, Clem. You know what I mean? We're, we'd probably do real well without you. Uh, but I don't. I don't judge. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't. But uh, but anyway, you know. So I'm, I'm looking at my anger. I, I'm looking at my anger. I, I am angry at everybody and everything. And then I read the, the big book where it talks about the actor who wants to run the whole show. And and that doesn't really ring true to me. The first ten times I read it. Today, I, I know I am the actor who wants to run the whole show. P pretend this is a stage up here and they're doing a they're doing a Shakespeare. OK, and I'm just a bit actor. You know, I come on for one scene, but I'm watching all the all the production. And I'm like, well, no, that's not how you should do it. You know, uh, director, move aside, move aside. Here's what you should say this and you should say that and you should. And here's when you should come on. And, and you know, I should have a bigger part. And, you know, I. I isn't that exactly what I did with my life? Oh, my God. If I was in a job, my boss was an idiot. My family didn't understand me. The cops were, were, were after me for, uh, for a particular vendetta. You know, I mean, I, mean I, had, I had all this stuff going on, and I'm telling you, I, I, get signed, I signed myself into a 28-day treatment program in early 1989. I got the hospital plastic on my wrist. 
I, my skin is falling off. I'm, you know, I had to be Librium detox. I'm just, I'm, I'm out of my mind. I'm shattered out of my mind. And the first thing I do is I realize they're not really running this place right. You, you know? As a matter of fact, I'm going to organize. I'm going to organize. I'm going to get everybody organized. And, and I did. I, you know, I found more boobies in the hatch. And they, I'm like, follow me. You know, I'm like. Aren't you the guy that's living at home with your mother, you know? You're in a, you're in a, a mental hospital, you know? Oh, follow me! You know, so, I mean, am I the actor who wants to run the whole show? Holy God! And angry when people don't do what I want them to do or act the way I want them to act? Oh, man! Oh, man! You know, Here's what, here's what would happen in the last, like, five years of my drinking. I would pass out the night before. You know, I'd just pass out, and I would come to in the morning, and I'd lift my head off the pillow, and the first thing I would think of is, those bastards! <laughs> you know, I had people that I was going to have to get even with, you know? I mean, you, you, you want to corrode any kind of quality of life. You know, all you need to do is be that cranky, crazed, angry guy. You know, and you will have zero quality in, in your life. But I thought all of this was justified, you know. And if somebody was going to tell me, Chris, you shouldn't really be angry. Well, what do you mean? No, they did this, you know. And uh, it, it, was, it was a terrible way to live. And I can see that inventorying that anger, in inventorying my belief systems as far as how other people uh, relate to me, other people, institutions, and pr principles, how they relate to me, was incredibly important. You know, for me to identify the character defects that are going on. Uh, fear. Fear was unbelievably uh, dangerous to me. Now, but, but if you would have come up to me when I first walked into AA and said, Chris, you're full of fear. I'd have thought you were crazy because I raced motorcycles. I picked up, picked fights with the biggest guy in the bar. You know, I was crazy. So if I'm crazy, how can I be filled with fear? I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, I was afraid of everything. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't leave the house without, without a drink toward the end. Uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I remember this one time I I, uh, I made a huge mistake. I was going to the Motor Vehicle Bureau to get my driver's license back for a third DUI. And I don't do good with the fluorescent lights. I don't like standing in line. I don't do paperwork. And, you know, authority figures, you know, standing around, you know, making me, I, that that's not my scene, man, you know. But I just, I don't play those games. Uh, but I had to do it to get my driver's license back. So, so I figure, okay, I'll just I'll have a couple of pops, you know, a couple of couple of shots of vodka. So, so I show up at the Motor Vehicle Bureau after drinking like a, a pint of vodka. Um, it's ten o'clock in the morning, and and you know, I finally I got all the pieces of paper. I got this piece, I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and, I, and I'm sitting in front of this woman, and I go, and here's this. So you you need to give me my form so I can go get my license. And she leans forward and she starts sniffing me. She's going. <laughs> Like this, right? She goes, you smell like vodka. And she starts reading my rap sheet. She goes, you're getting your license back for a third DWI? And you're drinking vodka at 10 in the morning? Did you drive here? You know? I'm like, I'm like, no. <laughs> you know? And it's like she had to give me the form, right? So she finally, she gives it to me and I grab it. But she won't let go. And we're like, we're like, finally, you know, she's trying to protect humanity. Oh my God! I w listen. I was a I was a bad uh, bad drinker. Any got any drinker and drivers in here? Yeah. And the rest of you lying good for nothing. So uh, I I know. Uh, oh man, I had I had some times. So, yeah. You know, uh, my wife Andrea is is over here. She was actually at one of the, one of the accidents that I was at. And uh, you know what happened this night was I, I allowed myself to to be uh, overserved, and that'll ha that'll happen. Um, we were chugging pitchers of beer. Okay, yeah, listen, you know if you if you're a pitcher of beer chugger, that's an important warning sign for alcoholism. Okay, you know that's not social drinking when you when beer all over me. You know, 
and I, I ended up, end up going out, going out and, and driving home. I made it about a mile and a half down the road, and the car spun around backwards and hit a bridge abutment. I get thrown out the back window. Right? I come to, and my legs are still in the car, and I'm laying on the trunk looking up at the sky. And I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> this, this, this probably isn't good. And, and uh, I'm driving a, a 68 Toyota, so it's still running. So I get back, you know... <laughs> Now, now listen, it's got three flat tires, not a window left in it. It's bent like a boomerang. The drive shaft is slapping the frame, and I get in it, and I start driving. So I'm going, whack it a book a bam, whack it a book about a mile and a half an hour. I drive by a cop given radar, okay? Just, just my luck. He's like, he doesn't pull me over. He walks me over. You know what I mean? And he, he reaches through the wind, the, where the window should have been, and, and he starts shaking me. Where'd you have that accident? I'm like, what accident, officer? <laughs> yeah, you know. He goes, what are you doing? Where are you going? I'm going, I'm going home. Why are you hassling me? You know. And he, he goes, where's home? I, I go, Bishke Ridge. He goes, that's 28 miles. You don't have any tires. I'm like, cops always hassling me, you know. Oh, my God. I'll tell a, tell a story about my last one. This is my last DUI, right? One more time, uh, over-served at the bar, uh, and, uh, and supposedly, you know how cops are, supposedly I crossed the double yellow. And, and I get pulled over. I get pulled over by this guy, and he just knocks on the window. You know, I've rolled in. It's a license, registration, insurance card. You know, so... So I, you know, it's my mother's car because I crashed mine, and and, uh, and I'm digging, I'm digging through the glove compartment. There's a bunch of stuff I don't know where. There's maps and plastic bags with crap in it. And it, fi- you know, I'm, I'm about five minutes, you know, finally I give up and I just grab the whole thing and, and hand it to the cop, right? And, and and listen, you know how they are. Get out of the car. Get out. Of the car. So 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 I get. So I get out of the car. Now, remember hazy recollections? You know, hazy recollections. Like, I remember a little bit of last night, you know. Well, I remember, I remember being taken to the police station and, and being given uh, some, some tests. And I remember that I nailed the ABCs. Okay. I nailed them. I, I remember it clear as day. I nailed those ABCs. That has nothing to do with me learning them when I'm three, you know, but I nailed them. And uh, so I hired a lawyer. You know, I woke up with the with the summons in my pocket. I hired a lawyer, and the lawyer is uh, the lawyer and I have to go up there, and we we've got to watch the the VHS tape because they taped me. Has anyone in here ever been videoed while you're you know? Oh, Charlie! Oh my God! It's traumatic. It's traumatic. You're going to need therapy, and because uh, it's just it's really disturbing. But what happened was, you know, I'm thinking everything's going to be cool, and I'm with this, I'm with this uh, three-piece suit lawyer, very serious, the leather, you know, notebook and everything. And uh, I should have known there was a problem when the cop handed the, the tape to my lawyer because he did it like this, <laughs> right? So, so I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> sure enough, he puts it in, he puts, puts it in, and he pushes play, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm horrified. I am crap hammered. I I am so I am tongue chewing, pathetic drunk. It's just uh, it's just awful. And, you know, yeah, and I did nail the ABCs. I nailed them like this. I need a cigarette. Oh my god. Oh my god. There's video of me where they're saying, uh, Mr. Schroeder, please take your hands off the police officer while walking the line. I'm like walking the line, hanging onto the cop. Oh, it's just oh it's just bad. Now now the whole time, the whole time the attorney is like really serious because I'm paying him like fifteen hundred dollars, taking notes and everything. Now I'm I'm like I'm like I'm gonna kill myself when I go home. I'm gonna I'm, you know, it's just too much. It's too much. And, and at the end, I didn't remember this, but at the end, uh, the cop goes, oh, Mr. Schroeder, you know, we're going to turn the, the tape off now, but we just, do you have anything to add before we turn the tape off? And I'm like, uh-oh. Sure enough, I look right over at the camera, and I go, like this way. I'm like, oh, no. Now, up to this point, up to this point, my attorney is really serious. You know, my attorney goes, oh, Oh my God! Oh, that's the stupidest thing I ever saw anybody do in my life. Oh, 
If you had any chance at all, you'd just blow it. Blow. Oh, I'm like, oh. oh. I lost my license so long, I thought there was going to be Jetson mobiles. You know, you know when, uh, when I got my license back. Oh, man. The humiliation. Oh, jeez. You know, so, so fear, fear, you know, fear. fear I, my fear was so bad that I needed to be drunk to be at a bar. I needed to be drunk to talk to women. Does anybody in here remember, remember square dancing from school? Oh, my God. Who came up with that one? Now, now if you're a normal kid, it's like no big thing, right? I, I mean, you know, if you're an alcoholic, it's like going to the front lines of a battle. I, I remember it was like a big room like this, and they lined all the girls up on one side and all the guys up on the other, and they blew a whistle. And you had to, like, run across the room and ask a girl to dance really fast. Oh! You know, oh, my God, she's going to say no, you know. You know, oh, it was terrible, terrible. And, uh, you know, years later when I was going to the high school dances with Blackberry Brandy in me, you know, it'd be, it'd be like, you know, hey, you want to dance? Uh, well, not really. Uh, well, don't come begging me later, you know. You know what I mean? You're going to be awful sorry about that. I mean, that, I, that's what I needed alcohol for. I needed the alcohol to change the way I felt about everything. You know, I, I would, everything was just wrong, and, and I needed out. I needed out of me. Now, now uh, the other part, the other part of the uh, of the fourth step is conduct, especially where it relates to to sex and to to intimate relationships. Oh my God, was I was I off base there. I was a I was a hostage taker. You know what I mean? I would find a woman susceptible to my limited charms at that particular given time and you know latch on, okay, it's you and me and I'm going to tell you what to do in absolutely minutiae detail. And and it's going to be your job to to keep up and read be able to read my mind, you know, and 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 not upset me. And, and uh, they'd be like, "What?" And so everything blew up like the Hindenburg, all these relationships. Oh, my God. I, uh, you know, I got married. Uh, uh, you know, I, I married a, a high school sweetheart. Uh, that, that exploded uh, you know, I, for the longest. And uh, I'm telling you what, what really re the guilt and the shame and the remorse that I experienced because of the difficulties that I would have and, and my behavior and my conduct in these relationships was was traumatic. I mean, I don't think anything anything made me feel worse than uh, than looking back on some of the some of the ways that uh, that I had acted really inappropriately and and uh, and wrong. So I've got all this stuff going on now. My, you know, my alcoholism. I got all this stuff going on. I am so burdened with the 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 uh, weight of Chris. You know, everything is just so painful, uh, and that's that selfishness and that self centeredness. Uh, um, even though I don't think so, that's really what the root of all, all of this stuff is. And, you know, when I'm looking at uh, when I'm looking at step six and step seven, uh, I think it's very, very important to read the black part uh, of, uh, of step six and step seven. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think Charlie and Katie talked uh, quite a bit about. Uh, ab about uh, defects of character that uh, appear in the fourth step and the third step, the third step exercises, and, and how these particular character def defects can be more uh, than we can handle on our own. I, I truly believe that uh, today. H here's, here's basically what I, what I did uh, my first run through the steps. I did the, I did the fourth step, I did a fifth step with my sponsor, and then I took six months off to work on my character defects. <laughs> Ask me how that went, you know. Oh my God, uh, what a complete waste! Uh, complete waste of time. Um, uh, it, it, it is. It is like whack-a-mole. It's. It's like you know. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna be selfish today. Uh, you know, and uh, and anger will pop up, and I'm not going to be angry today, and fear will pop up. It's it's absolutely crazy for me to be working on these character defects. Uh, you know, the the language in our literature has become willing to have God remove these defects of character, and then ask humbly ask God to remove these defects of character. And I think, like my alcoholism, my alcoholism was much bigger than something that I could just wish away 
or want to change. The same thing with my, my character defects. These, these are belief systems that are so ingrained. They are so deep-seated at certain times that, uh, uh, that me just wanting to change is not enough. It has to be behavior-based. I, I have to really, really participate in the removal of these character defects in a spiritual way. I can't go at them head-on. There's a, there's a great line in the 12 and 12, and I love, I love what it says. It says, um, uh, God will not render us white as snow without our cooperation. I believe that so much. How then shall I cooperate? You know, um, I, listen, I want to I not feel bad anymore. Even if I'm using selfishness as a motivation to get better, sometimes, sometimes the motives don't matter. The actions do. Um, uh, you know, I really, really want to uh, want to get better. Um, I need to take some serious action. I need to continue to to do uh, to do inventories. I think step six and step seven um, really need the rest of the steps. I I do. I don't think that you're going to finish up a fifth step, do six and seven, have all your character defects removed, and then move on to eight and nine. I think it takes a little bit more work than that. As a matter of fact, I've seen really seriously wonderful stuff happen uh, as it relates to character defects with the working of steps eight and nine. I'll tell a story about this guy that, uh, that I worked with. Uh, this guy's a Jersey guy, you know, one of those guys that know people, you know, and uh, you know what I'm saying? And, and he, he, he'd been down the scale. Oh, my God. He was on like 200 Percocets a day or something, you know, and four quarts of whiskey and this guy was just this guy was a monster uh, alcoholic and addict and and uh, he, you know the first year he was like rendered mute he would just like look like this I mean, he, was, he was such bad shape but he actually had a decent business and he was making some good money and i remember going to a meeting with him one one day and we're walking out and as we're walking out with our coffee from a 7-eleven he grabs a pack of cigarettes on the way out i'm like you know i'm, I'm like what you know i, I go hey you you, you just you just stole a pack of cigarettes. You didn't you didn't pay for those. He's like, no. I'm like, you took a pack of cigarettes. He goes, they were up front. I'm like, they were up front. What does that mean? He goes, they got budgets for that. They expect you to steal that stuff that's right up front. I'm like, uh, I'm like, I don't think so. You know, time time for a sponsor summit uh, meeting. You know what I mean? And. And this guy, this guy was willing to go to any length. So really, what happened was uh, we sat down, and he came. He came to terms with how much he's stolen over the years at these different convenience stores, and he came up with an idea of how much money and how many places. And he put envelopes together, and he and he went out and he started making direct amends to these Seven Elevens. And he, you know, he would he would give the envelope and he'd mumble some some crazy amends, and you know, he'd move on to the next one, and. Uh, I, I got to tell you, let me ask you this question. Do you think he still takes cigarettes, uh, you know, when he's in 7-Elevens? Uh, th there's, there's, uh, there, there's an amazing synergy within these steps. They're, the more that I have experience with them, the more perfect I, I, I see them. And, uh, and, and they're, uh, you know, it's, each one is the logical uh, follow-up uh, from the one the one before, and and I believe that we need uh, we need all of this stuff for uh, for our, our, our character defect removal. You know, in many many cases, you know, we're we're not even aware uh, of some character defects until we've been here a long time. You know, one of the things that I heard early on, uh, you know, most of the the one-line lip flap stuff, I don't give a lot of credence to, but. Uh, but one of them, uh, one of them that uh, I still I still see is very valid today is the peeling of an onion. You know, each time each time we dig into this spiritual work, it's like peeling back one more layer, and we start to we start to get a little bit closer to you know our, our core. A lot of the a lot of the really uh, visible character defects. Uh, what's happening is they're 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 getting under control with the spiritual work and with the power of God. They're coming under control. But there's stuff a little bit below the horizon. There's, there's stuff that sometimes we only we only recognize. You know, um, 
And continuing to take inventory of that stuff is very, very important. I can think of five or six times this morning where, where my behavior was selfish. And, and uh, you know, I was, the way I was moving around had to do with me and what I needed. And it really didn't have to do with, uh, with what, other people, uh, what other people needed. You know, one of the great things I love about uh, Charlie and Katie is, is their, their authenticity about, you know, what's, uh, what's really real and what's really going on in their life. I think, I think we could use more of that, uh, that gut level, uh, level honesty sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, but, uh, but today, uh, I, you know, I still, I still am confronted very, very visibly with these particular character defects. They're, they're at a different level. They're not hollering and vomiting like they were, you know, in day one, but, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're different, but, but they're still, they're still there. And I think, uh, I think there needs to be continued, continued work uh, continued participation in the maintenance of our spiritual condition, continuing uh, uh, to, to, to view these things, to inventory these things, uh, to make amends for them, to make amends for the character defects when they have caused harm is extremely important for the removal of these character defects. And, uh, and over the course of time, uh, you know, uh, I, can, I can become more and, uh, more and more willing uh, to, to do them. You know, um, <clears throat> What's really amazing, what's really amazing is that we, with, with these unbelievably grievous character defects and dysfunctional way of living, you know, when you look at, you look at just how bad some of us were, how, how in hell did we get along, you know, out there? Why, why, did, why was there not a net thrown over us in, 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 some, in some cases, you know? I, like, I, would pu- I would put up with behavior, in, you know, from a family member the way I was behaving. I would put up with that for about a minute and a half, you know? And, uh, and some, some, of the people, uh, some of the people just put up with an unlimited amount of garbage. Uh, in, in my life, and uh, you know, I'm I'm really, really, uh, really, really grateful for that. Um, I didn't understand that uh, character defects were at play when I was out there using. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't inventorying anything when I was out there drinking, and uh, and and uh, and using substances uh, in a very alcoholic way. Um, but they were they they really really were. Um, you know, it's a, it's a crazy thing sometimes what we do uh, because of alcoholism. I got to tell you, alcoholism with me was there from 13 years old until, uh, until today. It, alcoholism was just all over me. And uh, I did a lot of crazy things uh, around alcoholism. One of the things that I did was I used a lot of drugs to either enhance or prolong my alcohol experience. Has anybody got experience with that? Oh, man, I know. In this day and age, there's, there's more and more of it. Uh, and sometimes some wacky stuff would happen when I was drinking. Uh, I, just, I, I had a great, the great pleasure of doing a workshop in, in Tampa, Florida last weekend with my very first friend ever. This guy, guy's name is, is, is John S., okay? He's sober since 92. It was crazy. I was making an amends phone call one time trying to track him down, and we got on the phone. He goes, are you doing a night step? You know, I'm like, yeah. He goes, are you in AA? I'm like, yeah. He goes, so am I. It was beautiful. So we've, we've stayed in touch for a long, long period of time. But he was my first friend, and, and here's how he describes it. He goes, his first day in nursery school was incredibly traumatic for him. He walked in. He felt just like I did. Like, like this is enemy territory. And, and he looked around and everybody's having fun. Everybody's playing except for this kid over in the corner with a Tonka truck who's just like playing with the Tonka truck. And he goes, that's my man. And that was me. <laughs> I'm over there by myself playing with a Tonka truck. I don't remember this, but he does. So we've been friends since then. Now, I remember this, I remember this one time where uh, we're at a concert in New York City. And we would... We, Listen, whenever we went out to a party or to a concert, we got drunk first. Most people would go there to go. I'm going to the bar to drink. Why are you drinking now? We're going to the bar later. I would get drunk to be able to go to the bar. And this one time we go to this concert and we're both really, really drunk. And he gets the idea that we're going we're gonna, to uh, we're gonna go into the bathroom because that's where the drugs are being sold. So he goes, come on, come on, come on. So we go in there and so these, guys, these, these dudes are selling LSD, right? So we're like, okay, well, well, buy and eat, you know, eat the LSD, and we go back. We listen like to one song, and then we think, we must have got ripped off. We're not high, right? 
So we go back into the bathroom, buy more LSD, eat it, go back. What? Another song goes by, we're still not high. We go back and we buy more. By the encore, we're like this. You, you know, you know what I mean? And we somehow make it out, make it out to the van. A bunch of us uh, drove into the concert with the van, and uh, and we're we're, come, we're going out of New York City. Is anybody? Most people in here have been to the Lincoln Tunnel, right? The Lincoln Tunnel is like ten lanes, eight lanes, six lanes, four lanes, two lanes tunnel, right? <laughs> and we're heading out. We're heading down to the tunnel, and somebody, you know, we're all we're all out of our minds. Somebody up at the front of the van goes, "Hey, man, we'll never fit." Right? And so we move forward. You know, some of us move forward looking and he's right. It's a mouse hole. You know? And so 45 minutes takes us to back out. You know, we're like, back out. Coming through, you know. (laughs) We're not going to fit, you know. Oh. John, I had like a million experiences with this guy. You know, uh, God just protects, protects. We took the bridge is, is, is what we, we did. Took a, that was a little bit safer, but uh, oh, my God. This one time, the same guy, I'm going to tell a couple of John stories because they're fresh in my mind. This one time, it was 1972, and, uh, and, and John got some drugs to sell for his brother the night before, and he brings him in. And, you know, the, the alcoholic is like, Give me one of those. What was that, by the way? I mean, you know, that, that's just how, how we are. You know, we, we just want to out of us. You know, am I going up or am I going down? Let me, let me know. Uh, so he brings in this big sack of purple pills. And, and we're all like, what are those, man? And he's like, these are qualus. I'm like, qualus? What are qualus? He goes, oh, they're good. You know, uh, how, how much are they? A dollar. Okay, I'll buy some. Uh, how many did you do? He goes, uh, two or three. So first period before school, like 50 of us do two or three quaaludes. Any, anybody not know what a quaalude is? A quaalude is like instantly drinking a, a six-pack of Tall Boy uh, malt liquors. I mean, oh, you're noodled like, like this. You know? That's one of them, right? You eat three, and, you know, by third period, I'm, I'm walking down the hall like this, hanging on, hanging on. I mean, the ambulance is back and forth the, all, day, all day long. Oh my God! So, so finally, finally, I see an exit sign. I, I gotta get out of here, and, and, and I break out of the exit. And I, I tear for the woods, right? And when I get out to the woods, there's other people out there like holding trees. You know, this is this is really a bad day. And uh, uh, the next day at school, there's all these people like laughing at me. I'm like, what are you, what's, what are you laughing at? They go, they go, they go, Chris. You know, when you when you broke for the woods the other day, I go, yeah. He goes, it took you five minutes to go to 100 yards. I'm like, I thought I was hauling ass. Oh, man. Uh, so this, this insanity, this, this desperate need to change the way I feel, to change, to change the way I feel, to just get out of me, it's a desperate, desperate need to just be different, to, to not have to deal with my head. That's that's the that's the alcoholism that that's, you know, so uh, so sobriety, the, the, the brilliance of our uh, our founders were they realized that you don't fight alcoholism with sobriety. They had all tried it. They had all stayed sober for periods of time, every one of them. And they found that they just couldn't do it. The genius was through the through the connections with the Oxford group, they realized that you fight alcoholism with spirituality. You fight it with spiritual living and through uh, through enough adherence to spiritual principles and enough practice with the spiritual life. What will happen is the obsession to drink will be uh, will be removed and and we'll be able to start to, to put our, our lives uh, back together again. <clears throat> you know, uh, char- character defects humbly ask God to remove these character defects. The original reading in the original manuscript was uh, humbly on our knees, ask God to remove these defects of character, holding nothing back. You know, they, they said, Bill, you, you know, you're getting them people on their knees and you, know, you, you better lighten that up a little bit. Uh, but, but I think it, when you look back on some of the historical um, um, uh, surrenders, basically, and, and uh, 
uh, the, the step work that Dr. Bob especially was doing. Um, they were very, very serious about this stuff. <clears throat> you, were, you were admitting to God that you were a bad manager of your life. You cannot manage your own life. You're a bad manager. You need to turn the management of your life over to the care of God. Um, we need to ask God in a very, very humble, very, very defeated way. We need to ask God to have these defects of character removed, uh, to be able to move forward. I truly, truly believe that, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's been my experience that some, uh, some good things, uh, some good things have happened, you know, um, over the course of the years <clears throat> that have gone by, uh, my life has gotten incrementally better every single year, just like my prom- my sponsor promised me. I am so glad at year 23, I'm not where I was at year 22. As crazy as that sounds, I know exactly what he was talking about. Um, incrementally, uh, m- my life continues to get better. If you keep practicing these spiritual principles, if you keep adhering to these uh, um, these spiritual laws, <clears throat> that'll happen for you too. You know, you, the externals may not uh, may not get better. Uh, listen, we get sick, and there's some bad things that happen in our lives, but internally, uh, internally, things will things will get better. And really, it is an inside job. It, it, is, it is something that, uh, that happens with us internally. Um, I really thought that my outside experience was what was the barometer for my, my interior uh, feelings of self-worth and, uh, and, com- and, and comfort. And I know today that that's, that's not true. Things, things change on the outside. It's... Uh, what I experience out there uh, doesn't necessarily have to reflect back, uh, back inside. Uh, the spiritual life is not a theory. Uh, we, have, we have to live it. Um, and each day that I put work into it, uh, I get a ton of work back. Each day that I fall short, and listen, you know, I think being alcoholic means there are going to be times you're going to fall short. And you're, you're not, you're not going to uphold, you know, your new spiritual values or whatever. Um, sometimes we take uh, three steps forward, two steps back. That's that's okay. It's all part of uh, it's all part of a journey. I am so glad that this is a journey. I am so glad that this is not a destination. Like I I get to step twelve. I'm now sitting with all the step twelvers, you know, and we're we're done. I, I'm I'm glad it's not that way. I'm I'm glad that we have to revisit all this stuff on a continuing basis. Uh, because a journey is a lot more fun than sitting in some destination, you know, and uh, I'm very, very, uh, very, very grateful to, to be here. Um, let's, uh, let's end and let's have lunch. What do you say? Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.